Today's recap will be of the 2021 anime record of Ragnarok. There are three worlds that exist, Valhalla, Midgard, and Heal Him. Valhalla is the beautiful world of the gods. Midgard is where humanity and animals exist, and Heal Him is the netherworld, where hell is where demons exist. In the council hall of Valhalla, numerous different gods are gathered around, with Hermes and Zeus in the center. Zeus is known as the king of the gods. The gods all gather every thousand years to decide the fate of mankind. Mankind has been around for about seven million years. Zeus raises the question to the gods about whether or not to let mankind exist for another thousand years. All the gods vote to have humanity wiped out. The gods are tired of watching humans, unable to change, continue their atrocities. They see humans killing and hurting each other every day. They are also tired of seeing the beautiful oceans and forests become littered with trash and oil, much like our own real world. The judgment of the gods seemed unanimous and is about to be passed by Zeus. However, Zeus is stopped by a Valkyrie named Brunhild, who calls out to him. The Valkyries are half humans and half gods who help guide the souls of heroes to Valhalla. Her smaller sister is scared that God's wrath will be incurred upon them since she spoke up. Brunhild objects to the decision the gods all agreed upon. She thinks simply ending humanity so easily is cruel. She instead suggests Ragnarok as a way to decide humanity's fate instead. Ragnarok is an epic one-and-on battle between the gods and mankind. There will be 13 fighters on each side. If the gods defeat seven fighters, humanity will be extinguished by the gods. However, if the humans defeat seven gods, they get to live for another thousand years. Ragnarok is a law created by the gods as a joke because they can't even imagine humans ever defeating gods. Brunhild taunts all the gods by calling them chickens for trying to avoid Ragnarok. She is confident the gods are prideful and short-tempered. They would never sit idle after her taunts. Zeus and the other gods are intrigued by her suggestion. Zeus then tells Brownhill to assemble the fighters for humanity since she is half human and wants to save mankind. Everyone gathers in the Valhalla arena to watch Ragnarok. Heimdall is the announcer for this tournament. He has waited countless years to build the horn that signals the beginning of Ragnar. The gods select Thor, god of thunder, as their first fighter. He is considered the strongest Norse god and will wield the mighty hammer called Munir. Brunhild selects Lubu as human's first fighter. Lubu is the most powerful warrior from China Three Kingdoms era. He is always with his trusted horse, named Red Hair. He is known to wield a powerful halberd that can pierce the skies. A human monk begins praying to Buddha for protection. Brownhill tells him to stop since they will be battling the very gods he is praying to. Heimdall finally blows his horn to signal the start of the tournament. Thor and Lubu begin walking towards each other while emitting a fierce fighting aura. As they exchange blows and parry each other, they become excited. This is the first time they met a foe that was not defeated in one blow. Thor gets serious and uses both hands to wind up his hammer for a powerful swing. Before the attack, we flash back to Thur's past in Asgard, the land of the gods. Asgard had tall walls that protected it from giants for many years. This is similar to another anime you may know. Times were peaceful until they were ambushed by 66 giants. The giants broke down the walls and overwhelmed the flying guards. They destroyed much of Asgard and killed many citizens. The people of Asgard were careless because they became used to centuries of peace. They also never expected the giants to join forces and attack them together. Asgard was on the verge of destruction, and everyone lost hope. This was until Thor stepped in and fought them. He was able to single-handedly defeat the 66 giants using his hammer. However, he found the fight boring. The story then returns to present time, 
when Thor unleashes the attack he was preparing for Lubu. The whole arena is shaken up by the electrifying attack, and the gods think the result is clear. Lubu then returns a slash of his own with his halberd and injures Thor. And now the scene flashes back to Lubai's past, when he was a child. He was a strong boy, riding a horse, and aware of his own strength. He rode throughout Asia on a journey to find enemies stronger than him. He fought men and beasts alike, seeking a challenge. He defeated all his enemies and became famous over his 30-year journey. Blubu gained many followers due to his countless feats of strength over the years. The story that is told is that Lu Bu was captured and begged for his life in his last moments, but in reality he let himself be captured to be executed. He was tired of living such a boring life when he was the strongest on earth in his era. The scene returns to the fight between Lu Bu and Thor. They are both thrilled and happy to fight such a strong foe. Zeus is confused because Lu Bai's weapon should have shattered the moment it clashed with the weapon of a god. He looks at Brunhild and suspects she is behind this. Her sister Gol is frightened because she sees Zeus looking at them with a smirk. Brunhild had summoned her other 11 Valkyrie sisters prior to Ragnarok. The Valkyrie has a special ability called Blunder. This allows them to transform into a weapon best suited for the wielder. In addition, the sisters each have a unique special ability. Ren Gris the Valkyrie that transformed into an halberd for Lubu has the power called Shield Breaker. Thoromer glove shatters as he tries to block one of Lubai's attacks with it. The gloves serve to protect Thor by allowing him to wield his mighty hammer, Mjolnir. This is because Mjolnir has the power to shatter continents and emit lava-like heat. The humans in the arena crowd all become excited and proud because they are winning against the gods. Hermes tells Zeus that he suspects the Valkyries are transforming into godlike weapons to fight against the gods. Instead of becoming upset, Zeus explains he hasn't been this excited and thrilled since the Big Bang. Thor hammers drop to the ground but began pulsating with heat and energy. It emits sounds like a heartbeat that can be heard throughout the arena. Thor is glad the hammer finally awoke from its dormant form. Brunhild and Gold both become shocked at the hammer's new gruesome appearance. Zeus explains to Hermes that there is a misunderstanding to the story many hear about those gloves. The gloves are not used for protecting Thor from Unaya. They are actually for restraining Thor's strength so he doesn't break the hammer. Before it awakens, Thor takes off his remaining glove and throws it to the ground, leaving a crater where it lands. He then lifts the newly awakened Numaya and prepares to use it to defeat Lubu. Brunhild receives the list of the gods chosen as fighters. Shortly after, she is excited, thinking that one day people may call them god killers. Hermes gets the list of the fighters that have humans and show Zeus. Zeus gets excited after seeing the names on the list. All the gods are excited to see Thor get serious. Thor tells Lubu not to die and flings the empowered hammer at him. The legendary hammer almost never missed its target. Lubu barely dodges the hammer as it passes him and goes towards the bystanders. Lubu takes this opportunity to charge at the defenseless Thor right before he lands the attack on him. The hammer comes back like a boomerang. Lubu realizes this and, with the help of his weapon, dodges the spinning hammer. Thor catches the hammer, but this is where his true power lies. By using the speed and momentum from catching the hammer, he is then able to launch an even fiercer attack afterwards. Not even all the gods have seen this overpowered attack from Thor before Lubu rushes in and challenges the attack head-on. The scene ends with a massive explosion. A massive explosion from the clash of the two destructive forces shook the whole Valhalla arena. Both humans and gods are blown back under the pressure of their powers. Lubu manages to stop Thor's powerful attack with his helper. The audience is both surprised and excited by the outcome. However, shortly after everyone notices that the bones and Lubu's legs break from the shock of Thor's hammer, 
Lubu tries to keep himself up with his weapon, but falls to the ground as his legs cannot keep him up. Brun Hild and her sister, Gal, become worried after seeing this. Just as Thor raises his hammer to finish him off, Lube's horse runs over to help him. The humans in the audience begin to cheer, and it is clear they don't want to lose hope. Lubu manages to get up despite having broken legs. He gets on his horse, red hair, and uses his new legs. Zeus allows this since he sees the horse as an extension of Lube's legs. Lubu recalls that as a child, he became excited seeing lightning strike down a nearby tree. After he saw that, he believed that there would be someone incredible above the clouds. When he grew older, he would train up on the cliffs, swinging hellbirds countless times and breaking them in the process. He had numerous new hellbirds to replace all the broken ones. He trained regardless of the weather, through night and day. Eventually, he developed a technique called the Sky Eater, which would pierce the skies in half. He stared into the sky, thinking he would never get a chance to use this perfected technique. Luba becomes excited as he charges at Thor, since he can finally use the Sky Eater on a worthy foe for the first time. Thor also becomes excited, seeing Lubu able to fight again. Thor and Lubu both prepare their ultimate attack and test their might against each other. Once again, the two mighty forces clash, sending a beam of energy into the sky. Everyone in the audience becomes fixated on them and the outcome. As the light settles, we see Lubu's weapon break and his arms torn off. Despite such a loss, Lubu is overjoyed, knowing he was able to give it his all and test his own limits. Lubu then charges at Thor, letting him put an end to the epic battle. It is announced that Thor is the victor of the first battle of Ragnarok. The gods are excited and cheer over their victory. The humans drink in honor of their hero, Lubu. Thor looks over at what remains of Lubu and becomes sad since he considered him a friend as he is about to leave the arena. Red Hair and Lubai's followers charge at Thor, knowing they will die. Thor happily finishes them off as an offering to Lubu. Their dead souls scattered into the air, as they could no longer be reborn after dying here. All begins with crying over the loss of her sister. Brunhild and Gallop head back and decide on their next combatant for humanity. Brunhild decides on a man who detests the gods the most and is labelled as file number one. Heimdall announces the beginning of the second match of Ragnarok. He also states that the gods repaired the damage to the arena from the first battle. The audience, particularly the gods, become excited for the next match. Heimdall calls forth the next combatant and announces that Adam will be the fighter for humanity. Adam is known as the first man and the father of humanity. He was charged with the original scene of eating God's forbidden fruit and hating the gods. He specializes in fighting with his fists. Heimdall then announces that the greatest Indian god will fight for the gods in the next match. However, no one shows up, and he's notified of an order change. Shortly after, Hermes is seen playing the violins for Zer's grand entrance. Zeus dances to Hermes' music and is introduced as the father of the gods. He is also known as the god that killed his own father, Cronus, and created everything in the universe out of whim. Zeus transforms from his original skinny form into a large, muscular one. The gods all become excited to see Zeus fighting the next Dragna battle. Even fireworks are lit for Zeus' introduction. Brownhill does not expect Zeus to come fight so soon and becomes worried. We soon find out that the god who was supposed to originally fight in this round was Shiva. However, on his way to the arena, he was stopped by Zeus. Zeus tells Shiva that he will fight instead, which angers Shiva. Since that has been many years since Shiva has been this excited, he refuses, but Zeus pushes him down to the ground. Shiva almost gets into a fight with Zeus regarding this, but decides to let him take this round. Hermes was excited, hoping to see them fight, 
but became let down seeing Shiva just giving in to Zeus. The arena shakes from excitement and energy as Zeus and Adam face off against each other. Zeus warns Adam before the fight begins that if he does not have a weapon like Lubai's, Adam will definitely lose. Adam points up to the Valkyrie Reagan Leaf, who transforms into a knuckle duster for Adam. Zeus thinks that Adam has a good weapon and decides that he will fight Adam barehanded. Adam tells us that he will regret his decision not to use a weapon. Zeus begins the fight by jumping at Adam and throwing a lightning fast punch. However, Adam is able to dodge Susie's punch with ease. The humans in the crowd cheer for Adam since he avoided Zeus' attack. Ares and Hermes think it is funny how excited the humans are getting from Zeus' practice punch. Zeus then launches a flurry of punches at Adam, but Adam continuously avoids them one by one. The punches become faster, but Adam dodges every single one. This switches up his attacks, and he tries kicking at him, but Adam jumps right over him. Zeus then tells Adam that he can't win if he doesn't fight back. Adam then launches a punch of his own, scratching Zeus' face. This is surprised by his speed, but also recognizes his attack pattern. Zeus dodges some of Adam's early punches, but is unable to continue to do so. As Adam replicates Zeus' attacks from earlier, he lands every single punch on Zeus. Adam finally finishes his attacks with a kick that injures Zeus and wears him down. The humans are happy to see how one-sided this seems in their favor. Dal tells Brunheil that she was initially worried since Adam went into the fight practically naked. Roundhill tells Gal that Adam can use God's techniques. Since God created man in his own image, Adam is able to copy and mimic all of their techniques. Since he is essentially a copy of God, his special ability to see the techniques and replicate them is called divine reflection. Zeus tells Adam that he hasn't had this much fun in thousands of years, and just then he begins to use his footwork to speed up and attempts to kick at him. Adam dodges this attack and copies Zeus' footwork and kick, sending Zeus flying. Zeus crashes into the edge of the arena from Adam's attack. Ares states that it's like Zeus is trying to fight against himself. This is. Muscles swell up as he becomes excited from fighting at him. He taunts Adam into seeing if he can replicate his next attack. Zeus' fist begins to glow with power. Ares and Hermes are surprised to see him use that attack on a mere human. It flashes back to Zeus in his youth as he defeated his father, Cronus. Despite winning against his father, Zeus suffered a powerful blow from Cronus. Zeus is now able to use the same technique, which is a punch that surpasses time itself. He launches this fierce attack at Adam, but is met with that very same attack as a counterpunch to the face. Everyone is shocked by this outcome. The scene ends with Zeus knocked out on the ground. Previously, Zeus, the father of the gods, and Adam, the father of humanity, faced off in the second match of Ragnarok. After exchanging blows, Zeus was knocked out on the ground from Adam's fierce punch. It was the powerful punch that Adam stole from Zeus using his divine reflection ability. Ares explains that despite being a god of war, before he realized it, Zeus' face was punched backwards by Adam. The exchange of blows between them happened so fast that many couldn't even see it. Hermes explains to Ares what actually happened. Adam was able to barely dodge Zeus' attack, but at the same time he copied Zeus' attack and used it against him, knocking Zeus out. Ares begins shaking in fear, knowing that even if he trained hard for a thousand years, he probably couldn't beat Adam. Heimdall runs over to announce to everyone that Zeus was knocked out and down for the count. Shiva becomes upset upon seeing Zeus on the ground. Gol was surprised that the copy could defeat the original. Brunheil tells her that the secret to Adam's strength is his hatred for the gods. It flashes back to the very beginning of humanity, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. They lived with the animals peacefully in the garden. Eve, Adam's wife, is seen in the court of the gods, accused of eating the forbidden fruit. The serpent accuses her by saying that he saw her in the sinful act. 
He is planning to take Eve for himself, but because he failed to do so, the spiteful serpent lies and frames Eve to get her banished from the garden. Because everyone in the court was a god and she was the only human, it was certain that she would be found guilty. She finds herself helpless in front of the inevitable outcome. The judgment comes down, and Eve is banished from the garden. Shortly after Adam defeats the giant guard and enters the court, everyone falls silent and is shocked as he openly eats and spits out baskets of the forbidden fruit. Adam tells Eve that he will leave the garden with her. The servant becomes enraged since Eve will still be with Adam, so he tries to kill them. Adam quickly uses his divine reflection, mimics his claws, and shreds the serpent into pieces. Adam and Eve leave the court and the garden to build their own paradise, run held aloft and all. The humans began cheering and laughing, thinking that they had won this match. Heimdall is stopped by Zeus just as he's about to announce Adam as the winner. Zeus recovers and tells Adam that he doesn't sense hatred in his eyes, despite what everyone says. Adam explains that it is only natural for a father to protect his children. All the humans are touched by Adam's words and begin praying for his victory. Zeus is sweating profusely and begins to steam. His body begins contracting and continues to release steam. Even Loki, the god of mischief, joins Odin to see Zeus get serious during a fight since it is so rare. Zeus wriggles in pain as his body transforms into its gruesome final form. Brunhild becomes worried as she and her sister instinctually begin to tremble in fear at the sight of Zeus's new appearance. Zeus smiles as he takes on his new form. Hermes predicts that Zeus cannot stay in that form for very long, given the damage he has taken. Zeus unleashes powerful punches from his compressed muscles at Atomic. Atom dodges them and counters them with the same punch that he copies from Zeus. Zeus continues, taking blows from Adam's copied punches. Brunhild begins to panic as she catches on to Zeus' plan. Adam's use of his divine reflection ability begins to take a toll on him. Moonhill thinks Adam is overheating as he continuously copies God's attacks as a human. Loki thinks Zeus is also overheating and taking blows. Despite reaching his limits, it becomes a battle of attrition and endurance between two. Loki gets excited by wondering who will be the last one standing. Adam begins to bleed from the strain on his eyes and body, which finally lands a fatal blow on Adam, who continues the onslaught of attacks. Adam becomes helpless and tries to defend himself against all of them. Despite being unable to see, Adam doesn't give up. He grabs a hold of Zeus' hair, and they exchange fierce blows. Zeus finally falls on his knees and reverts back to his original form. All the gods become worried for Zeus. But it is revealed that Adam had already died. Even after he was dead, Adam's body continuously threw punches at Zeus. Heimdall announces that the final victor of the second match is Zeus and the gods. Adam's children are sad for his death, but all stand proud, having learned how to stand up against the gods from Adam. Gol other sister Herest hugs her to comfort her sadness from the loss of another sister. Brunhild is distressed from another loss and begins binge eating plates of pies. As they contemplate their next fighter, Koji Rososoki volunteers to fight next. The Valkyries are confused since the only ones summoned to Ragnarok are in their strongest form, but Sosoki looks different than what they imagined. Brunhild gets up and knocks over a container of milk, which Sosoki eloquently catches with his sword. He doesn't even spill a drop in doing so and drinks it all. Sosoki tells him that 400 years have passed, he has never stopped training with his sword. He also tells them that he is still evolving and that this is the age at which he is at his strongest, which delights Springhill as the third match of Ragnarok that's being prepared. The audience notices there is ocean water in the arena now. Heimdall announces that the fighter is representing the gods, could be Poseidon. Poseidon is Zeus' brother and god of the sea, also known to many as the king of the ocean. 
The ocean water in the arena splits in half as Poseidon makes his grand entrance. The humans and even the other gods become scared after seeing Poseidon. I'm Dahl, who then introduces Sasaki as the fighter for the humans. Sasaki is the greatest loser in history, but every time he loses, he evolves and becomes a stronger swordsman. Many humans begin to disagree and think that Musashi is the actual strongest swordsman. The arena becomes quiet after Sosaki pulls out his sword and calms the waves in the arena. Musashi and the other swordsmen begin to tear up as they see him in the state that they wish to become. That is the one thing under the sun. Pindle signals for the match to begin. Everyone becomes confused as they both stand still without moving an inch. Sosaki envisions a scenario in which he is stabbed by Poseidon if he charges in at him. He begins to sweat as he tries devising different ways to attack beside him, knowing all of them will fail. In the short time since the match has started, Sosaki has already been killed by Poseidon 18 times. In his mind, Gold tells Brunhild that it makes sense why Poseidon is known as the most fearsome of the 12 gods of Olympus. Brunhild tells Gaul that originally there were 13 gods in Olympus, but one of them was killed by Poseidon. The god's name was Adamus, who was the older brother of Zeus and Poseidon. Adamus was upset that Zeus became the greatest god after overthrowing the Titans. He then released the Titans and planned to rebel against Zeus. Adamus tries to persuade Poseidon to join him in his fight but Poseidon finds Adamus pathetic. The Poseidon tells him that gods are perfect to begin with and shouldn't need to form an army. This enrages Adamus, as he demands that he look him in the eyes and show some respect. Adamus recalls that while growing up, the siding never looked him in the eyes. The one time he does look at him is when Poseidon ends Adamus' life. They rewrote history to say that there were originally only 12 gods on Olympus. In the early days, Zeus was hoping for an alliance to break out between him and Adamus. However, it all ended when Poseidon finished Adamus off in a single strike. Hermes tells Ares that no one would object to Poseidon decisions, not even the gods, and that Poseidon is the most godlike of them all. So Soki thinks it's amusing that Poseidon doesn't even look him in the eyes. The scene ends with everyone being surprised that Sosaki sat down in front of a god during the fight. Previously, the third round of Ragnarok began between Poseidon and Sosaki. Everyone was confused as to why Sosaki started to sit down during the match. In the past, Yang Sosaki was a disciple of a renowned Japanese swordsman. Hayakatsu, the nephew of Master Sagan, the head of the dojo, defeats another disciple and complains about Seizaki's lateness. He challenges Sasaki to a duel with wooden swords. Sasaki blocks most of his attacks, but eventually loses by giving up. Master Sagan asks him why he gave up. Sasaki explains he can't win against Kaguya Katsu, even if they fought 100 times as he is now. Everyone in the dojo thought Sasaki lacked talent for the sword, Sosaki begins to try and figure out how to win against Kaguya Kotsu. He begins training in forests and observes the nature of fights between animals. Sosaki's true talent was increasing his understanding of victory with every loss. After six months, Sosaki returned to the dojo. He tells Kagaku that after many tries, he was able to defeat him in his mind. Taikutsu becomes upset by his comments and attacks him. However, in a split moment, he felt that he would have died if he had gone any further with his attack. Sosaki then requests a duel with Master Sagan, which he accepts. Sagan unleashes a fierce fighting aura that thrills Sosaki. After Sosaki lost, he stopped showing up to the dojo again, but this time for a few years. Sagan has lost his eyesight but finds Sosaki in the woods out of worry. Sosaki welcomes him and brings him inside. Sagan is able to sense the many days Sosaki has spent training in the room with mental battles by feeling the cuts on the walls. Despite being blind, Sagan wants to recommend Sosaki to become an instructor for Dojo, but he declines. 
Instead, he wants to go on a journey to experience more losses and become stronger. He sought out those masters of the sword and repeatedly challenged them to duels, but lost every single time. He continued to use this experience to strengthen himself. That way, he can win against them in his mind. This is why he's known as Historia's greatest loser. The gods look forward to seeing what Sosaki will do against Poseidon. Sosaki starts with a powerful downward slash, which Poseidon dodges. As Poseidon is about to counter him, Sosaki uses his incredible, trained body to change the trajectory of his sword, which is very difficult to do. He not only cuts off Poseidon's hair, but also makes him look at Sosaki. The Valkyrie and humanity begin to have hope in their victory. Sosaki thinks the sword it first transformed into is the perfect blade for him. The gods become shocked as Poseidon begins to walk towards Sosaki on his own. Poseidon launches a volley of thrusts with his sharp trident. Sosaki dodges all of them, not because he could see them but because of his experience. Brunhild explains the goal that Sosaki had in mind when he cloned Poseidon the moment he stepped into the arena. He has simulated over a thousand of Poseidon attack patterns from the moment he saw him. After Sosaki dodges all of the attacks, the arena falls silent as Poseidon begins whistling, surpassing all of Seizaki's predictions. The siding goes on to unleash a lightning fast thrust that Sosaki is unable to avoid. All the gods get excited to see Poseidon winning and loudly cheer for him. Beside him, he becomes annoyed and shuts them up with a glare. Poseidon then jumps into the air and rains countless thrusts down upon Sosaki. Sosaki dodges and parries all of his attacks, and he evolves with each attack, becoming closer and closer to becoming a god himself. However, just when he thinks he has predicted all of Poseidon's attacks, Poseidon exceeds his predictions yet again. Sosaki attempted to cut him down, but Poseidon dodged his attack. Finally, Poseidon breaks his sword with his trident. The Valkyrie and humans begin to lose hope against Sasaki. Can't win without a godly weapon. As Sasaki sees the reflection of Sasha on his broken blade, he recalls the past. Many years ago, Sasaki challenged Masashi to a duel. Sasaki almost surrendered but continued the duel with Musashi because it was too much fun. He was able to wound Musisha's face but was eventually cut down. Despite Musisha's death, they both respected each other and had the time of their lives during the epic duel. Sosaki walks over and picks up the other piece of his blade on the ground. Both blades begin glowing with energy and transform into two new swords. Brunheil tells Gaul that Christ can transform into two weapons because Christ has two powers that dwell within her. Sasaki readies his stance and prepares to continue the fight. As he parries Poseidon attacks one by one, he appears just like Musashi Darsum. Musashi explained that Sasaki was using the techniques he learned from the various masters he had fought in the past. Sasaki blades reach and cut Poseidon one by one. The gods became surprised to see him beside and covered in bloody wounds. Poseidon begins whistling as he slicks his hair back with his own blood. He thinks Sosaki is becoming too arrogant and shows him his place. The siding gets serious and floods Sosaki with attacks. Sosaki desperately tries to block them all and almost gives up until he hears the crowd cheering him on. The final is able to read Poseidon attacks and slowly close the gap between them. Sosaki cuts off Poseidon's arms one by one. This development shocks all of the gods watching the fight. Poseidon catches the trident with his teeth and attempts to stab him, but is cut down by Sosaki. The humans all rejoice over Sosaki's victory over the god of the sea. I'm done, officially announcing humanity's first victory in Ragnarok. The gods get together and discuss their next moves. Zeus tells the other gods in the room that mankind is strong, 
and they have to get serious. Shiva is pumped to go fight next. However, the Greek gods want to pay mankind back first after the loss of Poseidon. Gol catches Brunheil talking to Hermes about something in private. Heimdall announces that the next fight will take place in the recreation of 19th century London. He introduced the fighter for mankind as one of the most famous murderers in history, Jack the Ripper. The humans are surprised and upset that a criminal like him would represent them. Heimdall then announces the fighter for the gods. It is Hercules, son of the king of gods, Zeus. The anticipation and excitement in the crowd dries as the two fighters enter the arena. Will humanity live for another thousand years or will the gods wipe them off the face of the planet? Tune in for Season 2. Welcome back to the channel. Today we'll be looking at Season 2 of Ragnarok. According to Gull, humanity won the first battle against the gods but is now outnumbered. Brunhilde agrees and anticipates that the gods will use a formidable fighter. As Gol ponders who this fighter might be, Hercules arrives, exuding strength. Gol eagerly greets him. Hercules reveals he will fight in the next match but will advocate for humanity's survival. Brunhilde wishes him success. Loki questions Hercules' loyalty, but Hercules states that he is on the side of righteousness. Brunhilde reveals that Jack the Ripper will fight against Hercules, and on Jack the Ripper's demand, the arena has been transformed into a 19th century London. Now before your eyes is a replica of 19th century London, England. It's God versus man in a knockdown, drag out street fight. Now representing humanity in round four is this man, the most infamous killer in the history of mankind, Jack the Ripper. This is insane. Hell no. So that's the choice you decided to make. And now, the god who intends to avenge his brethren's defeat, the valiant warrior who fell both the Nemean lion and Cerberus, the bringer of life to heaven and earth, the unrivaled hero, Hercules! The infamous murderer represents evil. While Hercules stands for justice, Arthur explains that Jack the Ripper was responsible for the deaths of at least five prostitutes in London slums. Hercules proposes that Jack concede, offering to convince Zeus to spare him from Niflheim's destruction of his soul. However, Jack declines and draws out his weapon, a large scissor. Hercules accepts and vows to use his full power to fight him, but Jack runs away. Furious Hercules chases him to a cafe, where he triggers a trap, but his godly muscles prove too strong. Jack then fires a zipline, and Hercules swings his club at him, shattering his scissors. Jack retreats and reaches for his satchel to produce his knives, which surprisingly pierce Hercules. Jack reveals that his satchel is his true weapon, capable of producing weapons of different sizes. Brunhilde states that humans excel at malice, and as an embodiment of infinite malice, Jack is perfect against a god. Hercules is defending himself against Jack's knives. <laughs> Every last one! Jack just keeps changing up his throws! The Ripper is letting him rip! Slice him into a million pieces, Jack! Jack, you got him scared, now finish him off! He's not backed into a corner! Hercules is moving closer and closer to Jack! Get out of my sight! But Jack's throws are becoming erratic. Forcing Hercules on the defensive despite sustaining cuts, Hercules approaches Jack and attacks with his club. Jack blocked the blow with an umbrella, earning some respect from Hercules. Hercules then unleashes a shockwave that knocks Jack into a nearby building. Jack pulls out a switchblade for Act 2. The audience is seeing Hercules' tattoos expand, which prompts Loki to inquire about their significance. Ares is clarifying that the tattoos signify the cost of Hercules' achievements. He is explaining that Hercules completed the 12 labors and mastered the 12 divine arts. But each use of these powers causes his tattoos to enlarge, inducing unbearable pain if the tattoos cover his entire body. He will die, and his soul will be destroyed. Despite the danger, Ares has faith in Hercules. He believes that Hercules' true strength is his unwavering determination, which even the gods cannot break. In ancient Thebes, a young boy named Castor is trying to save a car from bullies who want to sell it for medicine. Alcides, who later becomes known as Hercules, is helping defend Castor but gets beaten up. Castor asks why he fought, to which Alcides explains his desire to defend what is right. While hunting, 
Alcides charges at a boar but is quickly knocked down, and the bullies taunt him about his weakness. They suggest he drink the blood of Zeus Ambrosia to become immortal, but warn that if he is not a true hero, he will die. Castor reassures Alcides that the bullies are just spouting legends and encourage him to improve himself in his own way. Zeus is seeking everyone's opinion to destroy the Thebes for their continued mischief. Some gods are suggesting teaching mankind a lesson, but Ares wants to handle Thebes himself. As Ares descends, the people submit, waiting for their faded demise, but Alcides steps up, trying to save everyone. He eventually drank ambrosia and started disintegrating. Ares thought Alcides was dead, but he returned with a stronger body. Ares' soldiers attacked Alcides, but he easily defeated them all. With this new power, Alcides was able to fight on par with Ares. Zeus eventually stopped the fight and made Alcides a god on the condition that he led mankind to righteousness. Alcides accepts Zeus' proposal as there is no other way for him to survive, and he becomes a god named Hercules. Jack and Hercules engage in a heated battle. Jack is becoming more aggressive and throwing his switchblade and knives at Hercules. Hercules destroys the switchblade and swings his club at Jack, causing him to jump using piano wires. What? What's happening? Wait, he's standing on wires! Jack mentions the possibility of rain in London and asks for an umbrella, but Hercules has already destroyed it. Jack uses the wires to shoot knives at Hercules, causing them to ricochet off the walls and hit him with increasing speed. Hercules transforms his club into a bird and uses the sixth laborer, Steinfelian bird, to blow back the knives at Jack. Jack acknowledges Hercules' unshakable will and apologizes for his excitement over killing a god with his special eye. Jack sees and knows that Hercules truly has an unshakable will and a beautiful color, he expresses his anticipation of what color Hercules will turn when he dies before singing. London Bridge is broken down in 19th century London. Young Jack scavenges for food in a garbage bin, only to be beaten by its owner. Living with his mother in a brothel, he witnesses a man leaving her room, sparking his concern for her safety. But his mother embraces him, assuring him that everything is all right. Although he has an injury, his mother tends to it and uses her earnings to buy him medicine. Despite their hardships, Jack finds happiness in his mother's love. Jack brings home a big piece of cheese, but his mother is upset over the marriage of a man named Jack Smith. Jack tries to comfort Mary, but she yells at him and regrets having him, saying he was just a tool to connect her to her love. Jack sees her aura turn red, grabs her by the neck, and chokes her until her aura turns purple. He stabs her, saying he loves this new color on her. In the fight between Jack and Hercules, Jack shares his philosophy that each person's heart is a muddle of emotions when they are alive. But at the moment of death, when it's overwhelmed by fear, it becomes a beautiful sight. Hercules disagrees, saying that he will not have a hint of fear in him when he dies. Jack scaled Big Ben to save himself. He threw the clock's dial at Hercules, slicing off his arm. It turned out that Jack's gloves are his volunteer, capable of turning anything they touched into a divine treasure, making every inch of London a weapon. Brunhilde knew that Jack's gloves were his volunteer and arranged for him to defeat Hercules. She forced Locke, the eleventh Valkyrie, to merge with Jack, turning her into his volunteer. The battle between Jack the Ripper and Hercules has humanity on edge, with Jack seeming to have the upper hand. However, Hercules refuses to give up, and Jack compliments his emotional control. Despite seeing the darkest of human emotions, Hercules recognizes the flaws of humanity, but still loves them. He activates the final stage, Cerberus. I summon the Hound of Hades! Is that... Cerberus! The fight intensifies with Jack using debris as divine weapons and even a manhole, but Hercules ultimately overpowers him with a powerful punch. However, Hercules must defeat Jack quickly before being consumed by his own power. Jack acknowledges that Hercules has exceeded his expectations but attempts to escape using a grappling hook. However, Hercules jumps in the air and lands a punch that causes Jack to fall and impale himself on a metal fence. Despite his injuries, Jack cuts himself and prepares to face Hercules once more. 
he reminds his opponent that all of London is his weapon and proceeds to turn his mantle into a divine treasure and cut down the building behind him. The building falls on Hercules, but he emerges from the rubble. In a tense exchange, Jack reveals that Hercules helped him realize the true nature of love. He then engages Hercules in close combat, using improvised weapons to fend off his opponent's attacks. Jack evades Hercules' attacks and attempts to strike him with iron rods from a fence. However, he only manages to scratch his opponent. Hercules responds with a powerful punch that knocks Jack to the ground, prompting the gods to celebrate. While some humans expressed disappointment in Jack, others were frustrated and considered taking the fight to the gods themselves. Surprisingly, Jack stands up and prepares to continue the fight. During their battle, Jack the Ripper attempts to strike Hercules but misses. Hercules lands a punch but is ultimately stabbed by Jack's blood, which has become a divine treasure. Rather than retaliate, Hercules embraces Jack and expresses his love for humanity as he passes the responsibility of saving mankind to Brunhilde as he disappears. Heimdall declared Jack the winner of the fourth round, leaving both audiences stunned. After winning, Jack asks Locke how she feels, but instead Locke counters with a question about how he is feeling after killing a god. Jack is uncertain. Locke states that he is a pitiable person. Unable to show emotion, she sends Jack to the infirmary while she goes to take a shower. Jack recalls that Hercules promised to save him from his suffering and wishes to see him again as thieves attack him. Some view Jack as a monster, while others see beauty and filth. Meanwhile, Brunhilde reaffirms her duty to save humanity but moves to tears when she pays respect to fallen warriors, including Hercules. As Ares mourns Hercules' death, Loki reveals that Jack had a clever strategy all along. Despite this, Ares praises Hercules' determination. Zeus expresses anger over humanity's tie with the gods and destroys the viewing area, vowing to prevent humans from leading. Later, the Norse god Loki asks Buddha by the fountain if the Valkyries have always been as strong as they were during the fight and proposes a theory about a power called Sambat Hanna that can allow them to resist the gods. Buddha breaks his lollipop, and the seven lucky gods appear, claiming to be orbiters of justice. Preparing to attack Buddha, Loki stops them but then joins their side. Buddha states that if they want to fight, they should hurry and release his aura, putting pressure on the gods. Kajiro helps Buddha while stating that he doesn't approve of ganging up on others. Suddenly, Soji and Asami also join the fight to help Buddha, despite being outnumbered by the gods. During a face-off between Buddha, Kajiro, and swordsmen against Loki and the seven lucky gods, Abisu shoots at Buddha but misses. Loki attacks with chain blades, but Asami deflects, and Soji manages to close in, but Zeus and Odin intervene. Fugin and Munin remark that fighting without permission is absurd. Odin ends the fight with an aura blast that shatters the gardens. Blast Dome Loki forfeits after sneezing, and the lucky gods warn Buddha about the traitors. As they leave, Soji and Asami also decide to return to their room. Kajiro apologizes to Buddha, and Zeus advises him to avoid trouble. Buddha laughs and says he answers only to himself. Gol and Brunhilde are choosing the next fighter. They visit a Japanese themed room and find the fighter asleep amidst naked women. Gol is wondering who he is, and Brunhilde is pointing out the Yakuzuna handprints on the walls. Brunhilde wakes up Raiden and informs them that it's his turn to fight. Gol realizes Raiden is the greatest sumo wrestler. Brunhilde then calls Thrud. The third Valkyrie, Thrud, bursts through the room's door as she is unable to fit. She wonders if Raiden is disappointed that she is a beast of a woman. However, Raiden is excited and hugs her, stating that big women are his thing. Thrud tells him not to joke, but Raiden states he never jokes. Seeing his serious look, Thrud softens up and blushes. Before the fight, Heimdall proceeds to introduce the god's fighter and reveals that it's the god of destruction. All maneuvers that were forbidden for him because of his incredible strength? At the east entrance, representing the humans in round five from Japan, Kamehameha Raiden! Okay. Next up, entering from the west, representing the gods, taking on the unrivaled wrestler. He creates entire worlds and destroys them for his own amusement, only to rebuild and destroy them again. There can be no mistake. Representing the gods in round five, from India. <sighs> Finally, it's my turn to play. It's the final battle between God and man, Ragnarok round five. The destroyer himself, Shiva. Shiva's wife and son cheer for him as Raiden performs a sumo ceremony before their fight. Raiden drop kicks Shiva in the face, but Shiva stands and the fight continues. Raiden lands a punch. Uh -oh. 
Buddy, you got a lot to learn. But Shiva blocks it. However, Raiden immediately follows it with a Russian hook and punches Shiva, causing him to fall on his knees. He grabs Shiva's head, intending to finish the fight, and knees him in the face. However, Shiva blocks the hit and punches him in the chest, sending him flying. Shiva expressed his desire to keep enjoying this fight while Raiden took a more serious pose. In Konnono Province, Japan, January 2017, a baby named Tarokiki Seiki was born, but his muscles were too powerful to be handled. And as a result, his bones broke while attempting to walk for the first time. He persevered and eventually developed a new set of muscles known as the Hundred Seals. To counteract the old ones, Raiden unleashes the Hundred Seals, causing his muscles to go wild to bring them under control. Huh? Seriously? After all that, you're going to self-destruct? Rude! I'm counting on you! He managed to throttle them into submission! For that is the Volander of Tamemon Raiden. We're about to witness Raiden. The man with the strongest muscles in the history of the world! <sighs> Raiden calls Thud and activates his super-muscular exoskeletal sumo belt. The Volander Brunhilde explains that Raiden's muscles develop abnormally fast, and he can barely control them without the Hundred Seals. Raiden warns Shiva of the potential danger and attacks him with a Kiku Ikamanji strike. Shiva survives Raiden's attack and counters with a barrage of cannon-like punches. Raiden falls to his knees but then crushes Shiva's arm. Shiva retaliates, but Raiden dodges and lands several punches. However, Shiva's punches become heavier. You've got skills. But so do I! And they begin a headbutting exchange. Shiva reminisces about his time with Rudra as the fight intensifies. In the past, the Indian pantheon was a disorganized collection of thousands of gods vying for power, with no one ruling over them all. Two relatively unknown gods, Rudra and Shiva, lived on Mount Kailash. Rudra trains by punching a boulder, while Shiva dances with animals. When two other gods asked for their help in defeating the Ashura Butcher brothers in a nearby village, Shiva was indifferent, but Rudra convinced him to come along. After defeating the Ashura Butcher brothers, Shiva and Rudra discuss their dreams and aspirations. Shiva apologizes for being a second-rate god to Shamba. While Rudra expresses his desire to become the greatest god in India and see sights no one else has seen, Shiva initially isn't interested in joining Rudra but ultimately decides to go with him as everything he does with Rudra is interesting and Rudra is unwavering in his decisions. Shiva and Rudra defeated 1,115 gods to reach the pinnacle of Indian Panti. Rudra challenges Shiva to a fight to see who is stronger. Despite Shiva's reluctance, he agrees, knowing that Rudra won't change his mind. The two engage in a fierce battle for days, with Rudra using all his strength to try and defeat Shiva. However, in the end, Shiva emerges victorious. Despite losing, Rudra is content with the fight and glad to have tested his strength against his friend. The two continue on their journey, bound by their unbreakable bond as gods and friends. Raiden reveals that he is enjoying the fight despite his injuries and thanks Shiva for showing him a new world of combat. Shiva and Raiden's fight continues, with Shiva's powerful dance moves overpowering Raiden's sumo techniques. Despite the clear advantage, Raiden manages to use his enlarged arms as a shield and surprises everyone with his resilience. Meanwhile, Shiva's body spontaneously combusts from his intense dancing. In a final move, Shiva lands a powerful kick on Raiden, but instead of falling, Raiden smiles while fighting. <laughs> What do you think? My dancing's pretty hot, huh? Raiden's smile catches the attention of Tanakazi, who feels Raiden's happiness and fights with all his mind. When Tarukiki was five years old, he observed a group of children practicing sumo, 
and after defeating several of them, Toriji invited Tarukiki to fight despite Tarukichi's fragile body. He unexpectedly sent Toriji flying outside the ring. His exceptional strength earned him the nickname Ogre among the children. Tarukiki questions his mom about why the gods gave him such a body. His mother reminds him that she prayed for his strength and encouraged him to use it to help others. Tarukiki became known for his kindness and willingness to help by carrying heavy objects. When a natural disaster strikes his hometown of Sharnada, Tarukiki leaves to become a sumo wrestler and earn money to send back home. Though hesitant to hurt opponents, he loses a match to Takakazi and becomes intrigued by the sport. Tarukiki begins non-stop training and finally learns to use his strength without causing harm. Tarukiki became Raiden Tamaman and dominated sumo with his strength, but he soon realized he was bullying weaker opponents and stopped using his best techniques. Despite this, he won 254 out of 285 bouts and became known as the unrivaled Drakes. Eventually, Raiden retired without ever using his full strength. Raiden decides to fight with all of his might against Shiva. Raiden unleashes a powerful open palm thrust on Shiva, blowing away two of his arms and sending him flying. Shiva stands up with only one arm left, and Raiden's attack breaks the sound barrier. However, the recoil of the attack causes Raiden's body to rip apart, but Thrud holds him together. Raiden tells Thrud to migrate his muscles even more, risking his life as a sumo wrestler. Shiva activates Dendava comma and turns red as he burns up. Get ready. <laughs> Well, you're just a royal pain in the ass, aren't you? Fine, let's do this. Those attacks will carbonize his body. Chance of winning? <laughs> Brunhilde compares Shiva and Raiden, stating that they both become stronger by carrying the hopes and dreams of others. Raiden and Shiva exchange blows in a fight that isn't favoring Raiden, as every time he blocks Shiva's attack, it burns his muscles. Shiva is more powerful than ever, but if he continues to stimulate himself to burn, he will burn himself up. Raiden manages to push Shiva away as the Indian gods see that Shiva is starting to crumble. Rodri yells at Shiva to not give up. However, Raiden sensed that the end was near and unleashed a final strike called Yadagrasu. Shiva intercepts the blow with Diva Loka, shattering Raiden's arm. Despite his defeat, Raiden expressed gratitude for the opportunity to fight with all his might and called for the release of Volander. Thrud refuses to leave him. Raiden says to her that he couldn't have asked for a better woman. Raiden accepts his defeat with no regrets and bids farewell to his loved ones before being beheaded by Shiva, who acknowledges him as a great man and thanks him for the greatest fight ever. Despite Shiva's win, Ares and Hermes have different opinions on how the fight would have ended. The sumo wrestlers honor Raiden by stomping their feet. After the intense fight, Shiva meets with Rudra and the Indian gods, and Zeus also arrives to acknowledge human strength. Meanwhile, Brunhilde mourns the loss of Raiden and adds a shrine for him, showing her emotional vulnerability. Zeus seeks out Buddha and asks him to fight in the sixth bout, but despite his reluctance, Buddha agrees and even hugs him. Golova hears the lucky gods talking and is caught by Bishop Monton and the others, but Jack the Ripper appears, distracting them with his offer of tea. As the sixth bout approaches, Heimdall announces Buddha as the fighter for the gods. However, Buddha surprises everyone by positioning himself on the other side, declaring that he will fight for mankind, and threatening to kill any god who opposes him. The gods are angered by his declaration, setting the stage for a dramatic and high-stakes battle. If you liked what you saw, subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to get notified about our quality upload.